the Ortho PAC, hosted by Sam Dyer. Welcome to the Ortho PAC, where we discuss up-to-date orthopedic topics for the busy clinician. I invite you to sit back and relax as I attempt to fill in the gaps between education, current events, and real-world practice. Welcoming today, Dr. Mallon. Dr. Mallon is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery, also known as JSES, and past president of the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons, ASES, is my guest today. Thank you for being here, Dr. Mallon. Uh, thank you, Sam. It's a pleasure to be here. I know you were a Duke undergrad in medical school. Your residency and fellowship, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I did everything at Duke for uh, through residency, because uh, I, I stayed at Duke and did my residency there in orthopedics also. Mm -hmm. And then I did a fellowship in shoulder surgery uh, with Richard Hawkins in London, Ontario, Canada, at the University of Western Ontario, which is now called Western University. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that and then came back and started practicing with Triangle. For those that don't know, I know Dr. Mallon from clinical practice. I wanted to go over a lot of clinical content, but I wanted to provide a little bit of background on you. Um, you're one of the most interesting and talented docs that I know. Uh, you've done so much in your life. I, I don't know how. I mean, you were a professional golfer. Uh, you're a published author multiple times over orthopedic surgeon and a busy practice, an Olympic historian, and just so much more. I, I have to ask, what were the motivations? Uh, how did you manage to do all this? Well, um, professional golf, I mean, that was kind of my life's dream when I was a kid. Like a lot of young kids, you know, I grew up playing a lot of sports, and you, know, you always look up to the pro athletes. And, you know, I wasn't big enough to be a professional in football or basketball or anything like that, even though I was a decent basketball player for my size. So I got pretty good at golf early and wanted to be a pro golfer and I did it. So, you know, after that, I, I kind of flamed out of that after about four years and I wasn't making much money. There wasn't much money in it back then. And uh, I had to do something else. I had to get another career. You know, my wife and I talked about it and uh, we looked at medical school I, I had never been a pre-med or anything like that. I had majored in math and physics, so I knew I had plenty of science. But I had to take a, a year of courses to get into medical school, and I had two deans of medical schools tell me not to even try. I had no chance, but I didn't listen to them. And uh, fortunately, I was able to get in. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how that happened. Back to medical school and orthopedic residency and the fellowship, was there anything that specifically interests you in shoulder and elbow? I had had shoulder surgery myself when I was playing pro golf. Then when I started studying it, I realized there weren't a lot of people that specialized in shoulder and elbow back then. Uh, now it's fairly popular. I also had an attending at Duke. One of my attendings when I was a resident, I told him what I wanted to do, do a fellowship in shoulder and elbow, and he told me I can't do that. He says says nobody specializes in shoulder and elbow that'll never work so everybody kept telling me things I couldn't do so I I just kept ignoring them doing it anyway so mm -hmm. uh you, you know I met Richard Hawkins at a, a meeting when I was a junior resident in a meeting in Charleston South Carolina and I met him there and really liked him and I'd heard his talks and uh was able to get to do a fellowship with him he left Canada in 1990, I was his, one of his two last fellows, so that was uh, very fortunate for me. I, I'm sure you see a lot of the what's the quote-unquote latest and greatest in the field. What do you think is going to be a big game changer in the future of treatments available in shoulder? Well, I think that cellular-based therapies, you know, PRP and stem cells, these have been around for probably 15 years now, and a lot of the studies do not really show great results with it. But... I think when we get the doses right and we do more research on it, I, I just have a feeling that cellular-based therapies, and I don't know what it'll be. I don't know if it'll be PRP or stem cells or what type of PRP, you know, leukocyte-rich, leukocyte-4, mm -hmm. and all the other stuff you have to mm -hmm. worry about. I don't know what it'll be, but I think it's going to be something along those lines that will will inject things like that and, you know, help things heal a lot better than they heal now. Um, and that's really what I think. 25 years from now, you know, will be a standard of care. Mm -hmm. Do you think that will be in conjunction with surgery or as, you know, in place of surgery or maybe a little bit of both? I think a little bit of both. I think uh, 
it'll be in conjunction with surgery in some cases, you know, for, for larger tears where we have to do a macro uh, reattachment of the tendon. You know, for partial tears or smaller tears, you may get away with just uh, uh, injecting uh, some of these therapies, you know, on their own. And again, it's all up in the air right now. I don't know what it'll be or, you know, for which tears it'll be for rotator cuff tears or, uh, you know, things like that. But I think something like that will uh, be important. With your background, I was hoping we could go over several things. The total elbow arthroplasty, and for everybody listening, that's not a very common joint to be replaced. Um, but there are some decisions that you have to come to when you're doing a total elbow, and I wanted to ask you about that as far as the components. When do you use an unconstrained component or constrained component? How do you come to those decisions? Well, I'll just give your listeners a little history here. The, the total elbow replacement was really developed by a guy named Ralph Coonrad, who was my partner and was one of the founding members of what is now Emerge Ortho, which became Triangle Ortho over the years. And it's the most popular and the most highly used total elbow in the world still. And certainly in the United States, it's called the Coonrad Mori because uh, it was later modified by Bernie Mori up at the Mayo Clinic and they sold it together. And I was fortunate to train under Dr. Coonrad and learn to do total elbow. So I did uh, more of them than all but a handful of orthopedic surgeons. Again, you're right. It's not very common. You know, you hear about total joint surgeons, you know, guys who do, you know, 400 total knees a year and 300 total hips. And I asked Bernie Mori one time, again, who's at the Mayo Clinic and is probably the best known elbow surgeon in the world. And he said he did about 40 elbow replacements a year and that was all. And I was doing, you know, at my peak, I probably did about 15 a year. So uh, that's not, doesn't sound like very many, but if he's doing 40, I wasn't very far behind, actually. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., Almost all of the models are semi-constrained. They're not fully constrained, and they're not unconstrained. The Coonrad Mori is a semi-constrained. It's got some play in it. Mm -hmm. I ended up later in my career actually switching over to a, a different uh, model called the Biomet Discovery, um, which also is semi-constrained. You know, the problem with unconstrained is they dislocate a lot and they become very unstable. And that's a really hard problem. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I would ever put in an unconstrained. I'm not sure to me there's ever an indication for it. Um, because the semi-constrained has a lot of the advantages of the unconstrained without the problems of being fully constrained, um, where you start to get increased loosening because of the constraint of the uh, prosthesis. You know, for our listeners, again, there there aren't a lot of those 15 a year there's quite a few, uh, but being a known elbow surgeon, you're going to see more of those. So an ulnar collateral ligament, the acute injury, somebody falls and sprains and they're, you know, black and blue along their medial elbow and medial epicondyle. Can you explain the difference between chronic and acute ulnar collateral ligament injury? That black and blue is blood. Mm -hmm. And that's an indication that something really has been torn fairly badly. Mm -hmm. I didn't see a lot of that. I do remember one young woman was about 18 year old. She was a, a cheerleader and a gymnast and she tore, she tore the medial side of her elbow doing some sort of gymnastic move. And she had a big tear of the medial collateral ligament and the uh, origin of the flexor carpial naris there. And uh, we, we, I repaired her within a few days. Mm -hmm. If it's really torn like that and it's black and blue and it's acute in a young active person, I, I think that one should be repaired. Mm -hmm. um, it's the chronic one is that we're not really sure of. You don't see the acute one like that very often. Uh, pitchers tends to be a chronic injury, mm -hmm. uh, or if it's acute, it's kind of an acute on chronic. They've had ongoing elbow issues, and then finally they tear it. Chronic injuries like the pitcher that's been throwing however many pitches a game for a long time. You know, the ulnar collateral ligament is on the medial side of the elbow next to the body. And the anterior, it's the, the, the ligament uh, has three bands, an anterior band, a posterior band, and a transverse band. And the anterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament is felt to be the primary stabilizer of the elbow against valgus stress. Reconstructing that ligament famously occurred in about 1977, I think it was, when Frank Job reconstructed it in Los Angeles Dodgers pitcher uh, Tommy John. And the surgery for it is usually called a Tommy John procedure now, or Tommy John surgery. 
uh, and it's done very frequently now in high-level uh, pitchers uh, or throwing athletes, some quarterbacks occasionally uh, in Europe in javelin throwers and handball players. You know, whether you reconstruct it or not, it, it's a little controversial. If you talk to major league players, major league coaches or high-level baseball players, they say, Oh, if you tear your ligament, however much you tear it, you have to have it reconstructed. You know, the results don't really say that. You can treat that, you know, with rest and rehab and time. Uh, but at that level, players don't like that. Uh, they want to get back and they don't want to take the risk that, you know, they might go six months of rehabbing and it might not work. And then they have to do the surgery. So they just want to have the surgery and get it over with. Mm -hmm. But the doctors that do a lot of this will tell you, you know, you, you go to see Jimmy Andrews. You know, he'll tell people, you know, you don't have to have this done. You should, you know, try to rehab it. And a lot of the athletes don't want to hear that. It, it's even gotten really incorrect uh, reputation in, you know, the sports media that, uh, oh, have your ulnar collateral ligament reconstructed. Your elbow will be better than ever. Uh, well, your elbow will not be better than ever. And you're not going to be a better pitcher after you have this done than you were before. Um, you may be able to get back to close to the same level. We even would get kids coming in, high school throwers, and the parents would want their elbows. I had one, and I've heard of other people who had this too. They wanted their elbows reconstructed to make their elbows stronger so they could be a better pitcher down the road. And like that's that's insanity. Don't don't do that. You can treat some of these, you know, conservatively with rehab uh, and uh, you know time and rest. But unfortunately, the impetus from the athletes and the trainers and the coaches is to do the surgery. Um, so it, it's hard. If, if you don't do it, they're going down the street and have someone else do it, I can assure you of that. So mm -hmm. it, it's kind of a, a tough one for us. Uh, we know what we think the best thing should be to do, but we can't always uh, get the athletes to do that. I see a lot of kids who are, you know, they're the next rock star in baseball or, you know, hockey. Their parents are like, oh, yeah, these are greatest thing since aluminum can. So, so you're going to see these folks coming in with their parents really putting a lot of pressure. Um, Tommy John surgery on a teenage pitcher whose parents and coach think he is the next big major league baseball prospect. Well, yeah, the thing that we get is the parents, you know, always think their kid is the next, you know, the next uh, Clayton Kershaw <laughs> uh, or Sandy Kovac, or yeah. some Olympic athlete. Uh -huh. uh, you know, if if it's a young kid, uh, that doesn't mean he can't have the elbow surgery if he actually tore it. I mean, if you get a grossly unstable elbow, you know, with acute pain on valgus stress or tenderness over the medial uh, collateral ligament on palpation or an MRI that shows a complete tear, I'd reconstruct it in them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these Young kids with uh, kind of micro tears that you really can't see, you know, I would definitely say this should be uh, rest, uh, rehab, and give it six months before you do anything. What about radial head fractures? I'm sure everybody that does orthopedics knows about radial head fractures, but what about a displaced fracture? Um, can you talk a little bit about the ulnar collateral ligament integrity? Um, and why is that important in deciding to do a radial head replacement or not? Well, first of all, Ulnar collateral ligament in this situation is different than what we were talking about before, which is really the medial ulnar collateral ligament. This is the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, right, right. which may which may be damaged uh, in a radial head fracture, um, may not. If you have a young active person and they have a displaced radial head fracture, then they probably will do better with uh, some sort of surgery. Now, there are three options for the surgery. One is an ORIF, go in and put, you know, tiny little screws, sometimes with a small plate and, and small screws. Uh, that's one option. The second one is a just radial head excision, just excise the fragments and let it fly, um, which is a treatment that's been around for many years for elbows with radial head problems. But we mostly did it uh, years ago in rheumatoid patients uh, who, be, who got very arthritic at the radial head, and uh, they did fairly well if you just excise the radial head. You can have some instability problems if you fully excise the radial head in a uh, young active person, so we don't do that as often. And then the final option is replace the radial head, put it in a prosthesis, which does well. Um, there are some problems 
but the problems are usually related to technical, I don't know if you call them errors or you really just off a little bit on the size and things like that. But if you get one in there, you've got the right size and, you know, a radial head replacement provides pretty good stability and uh, it, it will lead to mild arthritis on the um, capitellum, the lateral side of the distal humerus, but it's usually years down the road. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Dr. Mallon is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery, has tons of experience in shoulder and elbow. Uh, really appreciate his opinions and time. Well, thanks, Sam. It was fun to do. You, you always, uh, Sam is a great PA who uh, helped me a lot uh, in my practice. Thank you for joining the Ortho PAC podcast. Please visit paos.org where members can purchase virtual CME content. This is accessed by clicking on the CME tab on the title bar following the drop down, which is the Learning Center. For non members, please visit the aapa.org website for PAOS virtual content.